Wonderful. Well, I think we're going to start. Uh, we've got so much to go through, so probably a good starting point. Um, five years ago, I was actually, when I spoke at Star West, I actually was wearing the Oculus headset. Uh, at that point in time, we were looking at automating it. Um, you know, the Oculus is just a, a standard um, Android device with a custom um, Samsung uh, system on chip. But actually now things have moved into the kind of the metaverse or mixed reality, which is what you're seeing live at the moment. Um, actually, I was <coughs> at Microsoft uh, campus in Silicon Valley a couple of weeks back uh, with Ruben, who's the, the head of the HoloLens, and we we're looking at testing these devices um, and how we can actually use automation capabilities, which is, I guess, what we're talking about in this fantastic event uh, today. So anyway, let me move on to my slides uh, and let's get going. Okay. So I uh, gracefully renamed this presentation to uh, Sky West um, because I realized that <clears throat> I'm gonna be talking about, I realize the dog's still here now, which is a bit weird. Um, we're talking about uh, quantum computing, uh, the metaverse, and cyber robotics, um, and, and how to test these kind of systems. Uh, you can probably see in the background, uh, I did my, when I did my TED talk, um, I was actually talking about augmented reality, uh, about how we're, the future is going to be. Of course, with Apple and Google uh, are looking to bring these devices uh, into the kind of into, into production for 2025. Um, so you know this technology is is going to be consumer based, not just uh, you know the the big focus for Meta at the moment to to look at actually bringing them into Meta workspaces into the future of collaboration. So lots of exciting use cases, and hopefully we'll get to share a little bit of those today. So it's interesting being back at Star West. Um, you know I've been doing test automations for the last four decades, started in the 90s, uh, and so obviously. Like everyone starting in the, the 90s, I started with XRunner and then WinRunner, uh, the Mercury and then HP products at the time. Uh, but not many people know that actually Keysight is originally what Hewlett and Packard was creating in the garage back in 1939. Uh, they were making the first test instrument, which was the 200D, which they actually delivered to Disney, which is where we are today. Um, uh, for Fantasia, so it was the first ever stereo sound was created by uh, Bill and Dave's uh, test equipment that allowed them to split the, the signals. So in essence, Keysight now are the, the largest pure play testing uh, vendor on the planet. You know, we've been kind of, we've, we've changed over many years and I guess for some of you will be familiar with the, the bottom right with uh, eggplant. So. Uh, Keysight acquired Eggplant as part of their first kind of commitment to, um, I'm going to have to get rid of that, uh, it's going to keep on hitting me, um, first commitment towards going into software testing, which I think, you know, um, hardware and software sometimes is not always uh, focused on where kind of abstract hardware from uh, the complexity of these systems. Um, so to kind of give you an idea of some of the solutions that we've been, uh, I'm going to be showing you today, which range from things like the metaverse, uh, robotic uh, systems like what uh, Elon uh, showcased to us this week, um, some quantum computing stuff that we're now doing with, uh, with Microsoft uh, Azure Quantum, um, and some of the stuff that we're doing in the kind of the military landscape as well, and, and CAR2X. So some really interesting case studies which you can kind of... Uh, hopefully bring some of this testing to life. Um, so yeah, so a large scale company, uh, and what I've really enjoyed about being part of the acquisition um, to, to join the Keysight family is that they've just got such a, a, a far reach when it comes to R&D, and obviously a bit like HP did at the end of the day, they've got the, the ability to actually invest a large amount in R&D for things like next generation, uh, cognitive quality engineering platforms, which is kind of where my team, which is based out in Cambridge uh, in the UK, uh, are focusing on building the next next gen uh, solutions. So I've actually got this week, I'm, I'm, I'm flying to um, Tokyo uh, after this session to do a press release. So we're actually doing a, a four-day uh, Keysight World event that's uh, online this week. 
Uh, the first day is around 5 and 6G. Uh, so we actually started testing the first ever 6G wave uh, in the lab when I was uh, in our Santa Rosa office the other day. Um, and then the second day is around quantum computing. Third day, I'm actually speaking around um, digital twins and artificial intelligence, um, which is kind of what we, I guess we were talking a little bit about today in the sense of you know, the opportunity to apply things like automation to, to help accelerate your, some of those tasks that you're doing as part of the digital grind. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's the, the three days and somewhere uh, in this vast amount of things is me uh, with uh, Dr. P uh, Poppy Crum from Stanford University, who's a, a, a neuroscientist. So yeah, we're really trying to push the barrier when it comes to kind of next generation capabilities and weave in what we've got within our heritage for automation uh, and build on top of that analytics and insight. And to give you a bit of an idea of what that range looks like, uh, you know, I kind of was talking to someone uh, who came by the booth today, talking about how we're actually able to test um, and do protocol emulation. Uh, so we can actually intercept the, the communication that's going between this device uh, in Wi-Fi 6 to, to my laptop over there, but we're also able to inject uh, packet loss or do any of the network digital twins as well as actually doing the software, API, uh, and any of the simulation components on the left-hand side. So we've got that kind of building blocks to start building intelligence on top of our solutions and provide predictive analytics, uh, predictive testing, and predictive quality kind of metrics. So that was the, the bit of a spiel. Now I'll get into the kind of the main uh, conversation of what, what Eggplant and also the metaverse is all about. And I'm gonna show you some of the, the, literally all the demos that I'm gonna be demoing are things that have happened probably in the last two or three weeks. So I try to keep it as, as relevant as possible. Um, but you know, it's interesting because uh, someone came up to me today and said, you know, can, we, can you truly test anything from you know, a, a mixed reality headset like I'm, I'm wearing at the moment to a robotic physical system of interacting and, and clicking on things? And I said, yep, of course we can. Um, but we're kind of shifting from, I guess, that all, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional way that I started within the waterfall landscape. I'm going to be kind of going through two really interesting kind of case studies as part of this, because I know I, I teased about the metaverse but also around digital twins. And I want to kind of tell you a little bit about why they're important, how you can actually utilize them. I'm actually gonna show you how to be able to autonomously create test or, uh, cases uh, or, uh, just through observing test behavior. So that tr traditional kind of viewpoint, and then we've of course, we've seen this shift left. Uh, and for those that know me quite well, I've kind of been focusing on shift right a lot more than shift left with a viewpoint that you can learn and observe a lot more. And I just did a, a live stream with Joe Colantonio and Andreas from uh, Dynatrace, and we're talking about kind of test observability and the importance of being able to understand what happens uh, in the real world, what your real users are doing, uh, and then learning from that and creating a digital twin off that system or s systems of systems. And what we're trying to do is, is you know, look at quality in a different way. And I know quality is a, an absolute nightmare of a word. And uh, my friend, Paul Gerard is speaking at Hostef uh, at the moment. Uh, and we always have this kind of debate about, well, what is quality, right? You know, quality engineering seems to be a bit of a trend uh, in topic at the moment. But what does quality mean when it comes to testing? Of course, they're not directly related. Uh, and I'm sure if Michael was here, uh, Bolton was here, he, he would probably have something to say about it. Um, but you know, we know this kind of quality lifecycle management. We know the value between each one of these components and the outputs. And you know, Joe was when we, when we was talking on the live stream. Joe was kind of saying, "Well, actually, the data that comes out of all these systems." And I'm going to use the word exhaust data for a second, uh, but purely just to give you an idea. Uh, but all the exhaust data that comes out of all of these systems, that's the data that we're actually using to feed into our quantum computing stuff that we're working on at the moment. So there's huge amounts of data which we don't seem to be doing much with. And I think that's a combination of this kind of move from maturity of you know, wanting to go from you know, basic capabilities to you know, doing you know, continuous quality or you know, continuous deployment, which I know we've talked about for many years now. Um, and you know, I think there's still very few companies that are doing you know, continuous de deployment, right? Uh, it's more... You know, they've got the capability to do it, whether they choose to do it is, is a massive question. 
So with that, I'm going to kind of talk about this kind of dilemma of, of shifting the conversation upwards towards uh, quality. Um, and, you know, I, I, I did a presentation to Diego the other day, and I was kind of saying, you know, the problem is, is we've got thousands of teams that sit under here, and we've got thousands of different technology platforms in organizations. It could be hundreds uh, in like a large financial services. How do we actually understand at the top level uh, and communicate quality across all of those different pillars? And of course, value stream management, the agile community has definitely taken advantage of that a little bit. But quality stream management is also how we articulate that information and also risk, which is what we've been talking, uh, you know, I was talking to Joe about on the podcast. And I said to Joe, I said, um, one of the things that Satish, who's our, uh, Satish, who's our CEO, was, I was talking to him last week about is that hardware, we have uh, a quality certification. We have a, you know, this device which I'm wearing now will have a CE mark on it, which states that there's a certain amount of quality inspection that's happened on that device, but we just don't have the same for software. And if we kind of look over on the right-hand side, you know, being able to aspirationally understand where we are today from uh, you know, a pipeline architecture, security, performance, uh, and I know the, the guys from Parasoft will be talking a little bit about this on the session afterwards, be able to you know, understand where we are and where we aspirationally want to go to, to really to manage that, that risk and, and, and quality component. So, you know, eggplant, we've kind of tried to change things and it made it very easy in that kind of the, the difficult triangle of quality, speed, uh, and time. You know, how do we help you, you know, quickly lower the barrier of entry, be able to test any system, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a HoloLens, uh, or, you know, I'm looking up at an astronaut at the moment, and we, we sent out the, uh, the rover, which was tested by Eggplant, because, you know, any system, as long as you can see it or interact with it, then we can test it. Uh, and this is kind of the unique uh, kind of component within uh, the, key, the key site uh, offering, but also some of the heritage on this side around being able to test things like car to x uh, infrastructure to x uh, which I'm going to show you some, some interesting demos of, uh, in the next couple of slides. So back to the metaverse for a second, as I keep on walking into the same people on here, I should, have, should maybe just take this off for a second. Um, but uh, going back to the metaverse, oh, that's very different to <laughs> the real world. I'm not sure I like it. Um, but you know, so these are all the de devices that actually Keysight uh, make. Um, and we actually use these devices. So we've got these large environmental chambers over here. Um, so eventually get my, I guess it doesn't like the idea that I'm not aiming it at that screen. But so we've got these kind of large environmental containers here where we can actually put in things like the HoloLens. Um, and then we can add in things like temperature control, robotics. Uh, we can channel, we can change the underlying signature uh, signal. And then we've got all these components underneath it actually able to measure and test those systems. And we bring all of that together to allow us to test everything across the entire stack. Uh, so actually, I presented this, this slide to Microsoft a couple of weeks back, um, and also to Meta. And you know, part of it is we, this kind of the abstraction, I guess the, the triangle, which I did see on somebody's slide uh, for the next presentation, so no spoiler alert on Lisa Crispin's work um, and Janet. Uh, Janet. But um, you know, testing the physical let systems, then the protocol, and then adding in that kind of UX, or we're going to call it for a second, experience validation are very different things. And you know why it's so important, so uh, Microsoft shipped 5,000 of these to the US Army uh, a couple of weeks back, a 20 billion pound uh, contract with the DOD. Now, of course, when they're in the real world and they're moving around and they've got different temperature controls, um, you know, they've already started getting some field test feedback saying people are being sick because it's not able to keep up at the pace uh, and obviously, the problem with VR, if you've all used VR in the past, is your brain can't trick yourself into thinking that actually that is a real dog sat on the, the, on the stage. So part of it is that you have to make these things as real as possible, which is why the augmented reality uh, and Meta are just about to launch the Meta Pro, which comes out in a couple, uh, couple of weeks, which also supports mixed reality because it overlays um, that technology, augments it onto the actual front. And I, I did a Star West presentation about how to test Pokemon Go, and we, we kind of took the geolocation, the network traffic, we took the feed from the camera, 
and we were able to emulate all that and actually then go around and catch all the Pokemons, which was quite good, and we used model-based testing back then. Obviously, now the models are just infinitely more complex, and there's millions of possible permutations because you've got six directional uh, things. You've got the um, gyro that's actually built into the actual thing. You've got all the camera feeds. There's so many more inputs. So my flight over here, um, as you probably saw at the start, you know, I kind of decided to just throw some stuff in there. I was trying to actually uh, connect to the Wi-Fi <laughs> to watch something. But, uh, but in this kind of environment, you can see where augmented reality, i.e. the ability to do maybe your work whilst you're on a plane, in this case, a very small amount of space, you know, being able to actually go and use the application. So actually, Microsoft, and, and we're talking to the Microsoft guys, they're releasing Microsoft Mesh, which is this way of interacting with people and um, you know, in a way that teams are. So you can all create holograms of yourself, actually come and start whiteboarding and interacting in the same way that Meta are doing workspaces. So, you know, we know there's this kind of new challenge and we've got new environments in that particular case. You know, I'm, I'm stuck on a 5G connection or something else. But what's different about these devices, and these are my guys, my R&D guys from back in Cambridge, is that both the Meta Pro and the Apple glasses, which will be released in 24, rely on eye tracking. And so does the HoloLens. So that way, when you're looking straight at uh, your head straight, but you're looking over there, you're able to pan into that area. But the reason they do that is also from a performance perspective, because you only have to render what's going on, what you're looking at, and not what's in the, in the distance. So we actually capture, using OpenCV, the eye movement. So this is uh, Nick's eye. And then we use a, a very simple Raspberry Pi to replay the eye movements and, and trick the sensor into thinking that we're you know, looking around. And then we track the movement on the actual screen. Additionally, we use body tracking for gesture control, so you know uh, all the kind of the connect kind of capabilities to work out whether or not I'm doing a gesture, uh, close my hands, and again another another photo one of our guys uh, hard at work or not as the case might look. Um, but you know, driving it from an automation perspective, so we said we can do this. We can actually, uh, you know, you might have seen this uh, from Tarek before, but you know, being able to directly connect into Unity, which is the graphics engine which both uh, the HoloLens and, and the Oculus shares is one thing. But actually, the eggplant demo that I was running at the booth, this is using computer vision to be able to recognize uh, anything in this environment. And usually when we run this, we put it on and we look away so you can't actually see the objects. And then we, we go and search for them. Now, it's just using compute, standard computer vision. It's, it's fairly basic capabilities. But we can also use that same capability to say, is there a tree? Is there, you know, I need to go and interact with it. And of course, from an automation perspective, it's not just uh, identifying the object that's important, it's actually being able to interact with it. So all the sensor information that happens as we're going through this, we can actually capture that and replay it. So they've actually got, uh, they've developed something called an auto test function, which actually dumps out all the parameters that are actually being used, and what you see which is maybe the most unexciting video ever, is once the OCR engine, uh, once the computer vision engine recognizes where it wants to go, it can then pass the, uh, the parameters to move it along and up. It may feel a bit like analog mode back in uh, XRunner, but in actual fact, it allows us to interface, send keyboard commands, look for stuff, obviously, probably not a great example, but all this data that's coming out within the VR API, we can tell, the temperature, all the device under test, telemetry information, and there's terabytes of this stuff which we can use to replay those same inputs and actions. So that's a little bit around, uh, uh, you know, that's actually Gareth in our <laughs> offices. I don't know why that's in there. Um, but also, you know, part of having all that kind of extra capability like the network protocol uh, capabilities is we can understand, well, what is it? What's causing it to not render correctly, right? Is it noise? Is it interference? And of course, in the battlegrounds, you know, they're using 5G version 16, uh, which is the ultra standard, uh, and then, of course, moving to 6G in the future. But they also are relying on things like satellites and line of sight. So there's a lot of kind of different components that require us to test things in a different way. Um, I actually took this from uh, Andreas yesterday, which is my favorite Dynatrace uh, <laughs> demo. Um, and so this is actually 
five years old, this shot, they're using the HoloLens to actually interact directly with the Dynatrace um, dashboard, right? So then they're able to go in and look at a particular, you know, you, you know let's call it real, uh, run, yeah, real user monitoring information. And then they're actually able to take the pure path information and visualize that and then do root cause analysis. So yes, they're both sat in the office, but they could be in Tokyo and somebody in a different lab location. And they could all be working together to try and find out where the problem is, uh, debug it, look at the metrics, and then potentially come up with a resolution. Now, this may feel like the minority report, and it probably will be in a few years' time, but you know, part of what I was talking to with, uh, with Hendrik and, and Andreas, who's actually speaking at the same time now, is if we can share this information, we can create open testing data that allows us to be able to monitor and measure and observe the system under test, then we'll be able to bring all of this telemetry information together to actually allow us to to do these next generation diagnosis uh, uh, much quicker. So I, I, I think I may have mentioned, but I was doing a, a se session uh, yesterday from, from Star West, um, and I, we were streaming it, and I was kind of saying, this is my vision view of, your, of, of the reaction, and this is your in, uh, interaction. And, and what's interesting about this is I kind of said to him that actually Microsoft showed me within the mesh landscape that he could have been a hologram. So, he could have been, you know, uh, Obi Wan, you're my only hope, projected onto that chair, and he could have stayed uh, in Brazil and just enjoyed his holiday, and we could reduce the carbon footprint. Um, but this technology has kind of already started to be available, and uh, like I said, it's going to be available very soon. Um, I also mentioned about Car 2X. So uh, I was at CES in Vegas uh, back in January, and we launched this device on the left-hand side, which was the first uh, autonomous vehicle uh, radar system. And so it actually it can emulate or simulate hundreds of devices on uh, going down a road, uh, you know, people stepping out, uh, which is really quite impressive. And you can see the model on the right-hand side of the video. You know, there's a bird flying across, it breaks, whatever it may be. But what you see down here in the bottom left-hand corner are our bees, which are car 2X. And so within the demo, you can see an autonomous car driving down the road and then a building uh, blocking the view, but a car that's talking to another car and automatically braking because it knows it's going to come around the corner. Not physically vi visible by the Tesla, but it is visible by Car2X, which is the whole connected car vision. So we're testing both the Car2X infrastructure to X. So if you were at a, a, a traffic light, you could actually just put your foot on the uh, accelerator and it wouldn't go until the... the the, the actual uh, light turned green. Or oh, not amber green over here, it's just green. But yeah, so anyway, you can see the, the radar emulator on the, on the, on the left. Um, and this is also some of our testing. I, I mentioned 6G, this is actually just 5G. Um, but we've got the application connected into Eggplant in the left-hand side. And what you can see as soon as everyone's favorite application speed test loads up, is you'll st suddenly see the amount of signal being sent is gonna rapidly start increasing. And we're able to analyze that, analyze the signal through the wave, and also look at the, the battery drain. So, which is really important because of things like the HoloLens in high temperature, ambient temperatures, how do they perform? How do they perform under heavy load? So, that's kind of one component. And I was talking to somebody about this last night, so I thought I'd throw this slide in. But the other thing that we can do is we can actually do to the beacon level. So, you know, when you're driving your, your car and you're trying to do a Teams call and it keeps on dropping, it's because you're going between different beacons. In this particular case, we can inject errors into those beacons and set up an actual call where we're making a, a FaceTime call and actually see what happens to the connection. And of course, we can put those, uh, some of the German automotive uh, companies actually use this setup and called Nemo and drive it around Germany or Munich and try all the different issues like GPS drops, et cetera, et cetera. So the last one that I wanted to show you, which I think is really cool, uh, is network function virtualization. And um, so what you've got here is you've got one system that's connected by Wi-Fi, the other one connected by 5G. And then what it's doing is it's pulling all the data off the journey and actually looking at how much of the underlying kit has been drained and then compares it. So we're actually able to do things like uh, and what the, the end result of this, this uh, very long A-B test 
is that actually, as you'd expect, the 5G consumes more battery power and therefore the battery runs out sooner, but also the performance is poorer than if it's connected by Wi-Fi. I know, you know, this is some of the interesting things that you see when you start testing them out in the wild, which is kind of the problem what I get all the time. But to test in the wild, you also need data. So uh, I was lucky enough to be a, a part of a, uh, an Oxford startup company called Grid Tools, which specialized in uh, TDM. And this was always the challenge, was if you want to be able to you know, mock out a, a system or an endpoint, whether it be a beacon or some other area, you need synthetic data uh, to actually be able to provide you all the coverage that you need. So combining TDM with these solutions is kind of absolutely essential to make them realistic. Now, in partnership with uh, Parasoft, you know, this is one of the things that we're doing is we're focusing on bringing test, direct, uh, test data management in, but also service virtualization together that allows you to model those complex upstream and downstream ecosystems of ecosystems, which could be thousands, if not millions, of different subsystems. And of course, we know, because there's the focus on the shift left aspect, how do we potentially look at stubbing some of those systems out? You know, I, I kind of joked with uh, Joe earlier about, you know, part of it is something like HBO launches, uh, you know, House of Dragon, next thing, HBO's gone down. You know, part of it is, is move towards chaos engineering. How do we start testing all of the things earlier on in the life cycle and then prove that they will work with the technology before we go out and put it in the real world? So incredibly complex. Of course, adding in security, which the, uh, the guys at Parasoft are going to be talking in the next session about. But adding that security on top of it, load testing and performance testing in these kind of environments against these complex systems like Kafka, you know, other streaming services, and even, you know, KA, uh, which I was chatting with the K6 guys yesterday, you know, part of testing these different environments is incredibly complex, especially in a multi-cloud uh, 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 kind of uh, situation where you're going between these different complex third-party systems. So a little bit about service virtualization, and then I think one of the challenges that we've had for a long time is really environmental management as well, because you know, it's great that it works in an environment, but the ability to clone an environment and then be able to run them at different phases within your uh, continuous delivery pipeline. So you might start off with some static code analysis, and you want to be able to test that system, and the learnings from that system, you're then able to learn and test in true E2E. And I say true to E2E in the sense of instead of just testing a system in isolation and waiting for system integration testing, you want to be able to bring all that information. So whether or not there's an APM in every single one of those environments and you're, you're bringing that information together, you're not just taste testing in isolation. So this ability to understand everything that's going on in all of these different systems is hugely complex, and being able to manage that is incredibly important. So back to more systems. I, I mentioned. Uh, not as, as grand as Tesla, but I know Tesla's stock dropped by 6% yesterday after they debunked the, the quality of the, of the robotic systems. So this is one of our robots, one of our junior robots. And what you could have, could have seen at the start is this first robot interacts with the system here. The second one, which is testing the ATM, uh, the, the pin and chip system, then puts it in. The transaction goes through, through the EPOS system on the top right hand corner. You then see the till machine system pop out with a legacy piece of paper, which I've seen before. Um, and then there's a QR code uh, that it then scans to say that that barcode and the receipt is correct. So that entire true E to E, the, instead of testing each one of these systems in isolation, bringing them all in and then bringing them all into a single digital twin is incredibly uh, uh, you know, powerful. And also this the ability to interact with the real world um, you know, gives you an idea. And I obviously, I took the one from uh, Tesla's uh, kind of computer vision system, recognizing some terminals. But on the right-hand side is actually a, uh, a six-directional robotic arm that Keysight makes, which allows us, we can actually dump these into the environmental chambers, like three or four of them, and then control and operate things. Uh, and then again, we, we, we do this through the simple modeling solution. So some really quite cool tech. Uh, not quite uh, Terminator ready as of yet, but you know, give us a few years and we'll, we'll get Skynet going, right? Um, 
but yeah, obviously I give a bit of, for those people who didn't watch the Tesla kind of uh, video, I would definitely say maybe that needs a few more years. But you know, if James Whitaker was on the stage today, he'd say uh, in his normal gumption kind of way, he'd say, oh, you know, these will be $20,000 and they'll be replacing manual testers, right? But uh, I think we probably need to leave them a little bit longer uh, before that happens. Um, so yeah, so going into kind of digital twins for a second, and I know I've already got um, 15 minutes left, uh, I'm gonna show you how we can actually create a model from observing the real world and then create all the automation uh, straight away within a five minute window. And I did do this live at uh, Swiss Testing Days, but I kind of stopped this time and thought, <laughs> maybe HoloLens plus a live demo is not my uh, forte, so I will uh, de-risk it a little bit. So we all know the advantages of model-based testing, uh, and I, I'm lucky enough to sit on the ISO Committee 29119 Part uh, 8 for model-based testing. You know, it's uh, a, a well-established uh, discipline, so to speak. Actually, I think it was uh, Star West where I first met uh, Dick Bender, which is an unfortunate name, but uh, who kind of really focused on dedicating his life to model-based testing and, and RBT. So, you know, there's an advantage of, 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 of modeling these systems because they're incredibly complex, but also those kind of mixed environments, being able to bring the service virtualization, bring the data that you need, bring the API testing capability plus the interface testing that's agnostic to whether it's not just a web page, um, you know, and really bring that complexity, whether or not you're testing Oracle, robots, IoT, doesn't really matter. So I've got, what I've got here is kind of the standard flow which we do, which is we observe a system under test. Now I was kind of saying this to Andreas because you'll see later in my slides, I do the same flow, but taking open telemetry data and log analytics from uh, Log5j and generate the same model. So the, it's possible to do with just any APM, whether or not using Splunk, AppD, Dynatrace, New Relic, whatever. So what we do is we observe the behaviors, which is this lovely diagram here. And then what we, we do is we split those user journeys up. Now, for those people who've been as old as I am for four decades in automation, you will have, uh, you'll say, well, you know, LoadRunner was doing this with performance application lifecycle 20 years ago. Um, but I guess this is the new approach. You can see every single journey that each one of those persons gone through. And within those journeys, we can then create a model with the associated test artifacts and then be able to actually execute all those possible permutations of the paths. Now we can run this obviously functionally. We can also run it non-functionally um, from, uh, from a performance perspective. So what is a digital twin? And I, I thought the best way I could probably do is use uh, Bruce Willis is the example of what a digital twin is. And you're probably aware if you watched the news last week, uh, unfortunately, uh, he's not very well, and he's actually signed over his digital twin to allow him to do future movies like Die Hard 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and onwards. Uh, but actually, it's an interesting proposition. You know, Cambridge actually did a study that said if you could plug in near, uh, Elon's Neuralink, download your transcendence, download yourself, like Johnny De Depp did in that great transcendence movie, and then uploaded it, it does mean you could have like a thousand Jeffs who are just working on a hundred different customer locations, all doing you know, automation awesomeness. And you'd be getting a thousand, uh, 10,000 income as well from all those different bots. Um, and I'm still trying to work on this. Um, but the other thing that I'm working on is this flux capacitor. So this is the autonomous design automation, and it's actually a bit of a, a nod to Ada Lovelace for everyone who knows, uh, the first computer programmer. But what they probably don't know is that she actually lived and died just a few miles away in Leatherhead um, from where our R&D center is. Now, it wasn't just because I want one of the new NVIDIA cards, which are also called Lovelace, but I'll be happy if NVIDIA do give me one um, after this presentation. But yet we look at it in three, three different ways. We look at UI automation, and we can use autonomous uh, bots to just go through and, in essence, just using fuzzing, just go through and discover the application. That's pretty straightforward. Getting information from open telemetry, again, that's really easy. Uh, taking real customer insight, you know, our platform, which allows us to actually observe and then create the test artifacts and everything else required, or even looking at 
a bottom uh, log analytics for log4j or even spidering it using burp suite, which that was what I was trying to remember. Burp suite is your integration. It'll eventually come back to me sooner or later. I love the OWASP guys. So like I said, I did this on stage and you can actually go and look at keysight.com and we use the word we eat our own aubergine or eggplant. Um, but you can see here, if you load it up, you'll see two files called stream and a RCI core. And that's taking all the information, all the interactions to the DOM, all the information that gives you the, well, this person was on this page doing A, B, and C tra uh, transaction. And we take that, generate this beautiful thing, which uh, is pretty scary. And you can probably see that this was done on the 27th of the 9th, which was last week. Uh, but we generated the, the model out of it. Uh, and then what we do is what we, we do is called feature clustering. And what feature clustering is, in essence, is we look at common flows. So the checkout process, right, is it very easy to look at. And that flow is quite linear. And we're able to grab that, but we're also able to see where things aren't linear, i.e. if you do a repeat order, or if you change something within the structure that actually had something like a two-factor authentication for a payment gateway. So we take this multi-transactional data, we add it into the journeys that we've, uh, we've observed with the system, and then we can actually create, out of all of those journeys, we can link all the features and start creating a model out of it. So this is what we refer to when we talk about a digital twin, and you can see there, there's some re repeat orders in the middle which just keep on going round and round and round. Um, and then at the end of it, it generates this, which is a, uh, a model out of all of those transactions mapped into the system. And then from there, we can literally just execute this, this model. Now, you may say quickly, like everyone would normally do, is like, well, does this just work for web? Um, yes, it does work for web, but it does work for mobile devices. We can observe APIs. So there's lots of information that we can actually capture to actually build these digital twins. And this is what we're trying to do to really help accelerate the creation and design of test automation artifacts, which was always the problem which I had when I was trying to get people to use model-based testing. Uh, and the other problem why model-based testing was such a bit of a challenge was humans want a certain level of abstraction for modeling. So a lot of subflows, and you know, they'll lay it out in a particular way based on how they interpret the system. And that could be at a, a UI level, that could be at a functional level, it could be anything. Whereas obviously taking information from open telemetry just tells you there's a huge, you know, a number of different pages that have been there and we can see the relationship between these pages. But actually the reason why we, 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 we use RCI is because we also are using um, kind of some, some fairly sophisticated machine learning that will actually allow us to look at the feature clustering and bring all of those features into a single kind of area. It's still not very pretty, but it's, it's evolving as a, as a way of uh, solving it. Anyway, so that's the, the standard moderate one. And then I, I've always talked to Dorothy, who's a good friend, and I, I managed to do a book with her on uh, experiences in test automation with, with Alan Page, actually, as well, who his name popped up at Microsoft a couple of times. Uh, but actually, we did this, and you can probably see in the bottom corner of the date again, the 27th. Everything happened on the 27th this year. Um, and what we did is I just said to the guys, go off and just use the system. Just manually do it. So like you would do with UAT, BAT, whatever. You know, just go and run all the systems. And then what I'll do is I'll just capture those when I wake up on the other side of the pond and then just rerun them all automated. And then we'll see whether or not the automated tests were the exact same tests as what you ran manually, which they were. But what was really interesting about this is it doesn't need to be just manual tests. You could run your Selenium frameworks. You could run your... Um, your favorite tool vendor s solution, and then you can capture it and then create a digital twin out of the model. And you know, part of what we're trying to do with this is make it so we're using things like XPDL, extendable process definition language. We're using things like business process modeling notation 2.2, uh, which is an OMG standard. And so that way you can get this information out as well as in. So if you've got something in Visio, you can pull it in, vice versa. Uh, but then when you run it back, of course, that exact same transaction which we saw earlier on becomes the steps that it actually will execute. And then, unfortunately named, mainly because someone didn't read a book on model-based testing before creating the product, is we've got a function that will then do all paths, which will go through all permutations with all different test data sets to give you data coverage 
as well as test coverage. Plus, you can do, I'm going to use the word exploratory, but not in the correct context. Um, it can also explore the system by understanding. I found an issue over here, which is something to do with a list box and um, you know, different countries. And I should expect that that same problem will exist in other areas that is doing a drop down. Tarex finally came to my, one of my presentations. It's like a lifelong dream. Um, so yeah, so part of this, what we refer to as hyper baselining, you know, it's this ability to capture the baseline information. Of course, you've got all the information that is part of that multi-dimensional transactional set, and then you're able to replay it and compare it. Now, what's really interesting about this is if you look here, when we re-ran it, so I, we captured it on the 16th, but then we re-ran the digital twin on the 27th. When we re-ran it, it went, it was seven seconds for the response time. So you've started to build in that kind of performance where you can say, run it against uh, system A, migrate system A to the cloud, rerun it, or you know, do some tuning on that system and then rerun it. And then you can start seeing and observing non-functional requirements as well. Anyway, five minutes to go. Stronger together is my kind of partnership on which is why uh, I was in, had the joy of being in Miami with, with Tarek at test.ai. Uh, but you know, part of it is you know, working with other people in the industry. So people like Source Labs who are sat next to us at the moment, if you want to come and see us in booth 11. And our friends at the front row who are going to be coming, uh, uh, will be coming in, in, uh, on next, which I'll put another slide on. But the, the one that I realized I put in the wrong order now. <laughs> um, so this is one of the things that we're working on with Azure Quantum is we're looking at, um, trying to create a standardized way of bringing data in that we can actually uh, process that data and then display that data out. And I was chatting to the Graftana guy the other, uh, yesterday. Um, you know, how do we make sure that we can get the data in and consume it, run all that information? You saw the Dynatrace HoloLens demo of, of visualizing it. Take you know um, huge amounts of data streams and then be able to do processing on those data streams using Azure data blocks or time series data from InfluxDB or you know, knowledge graphs for Neo for J, you know, build all these different types of sorts. And you know, it's referred as an echo test database, but it's a, it's a kind of a, a version controlled each version and, and you're running the analytics against each one, not just running it on the current set. So as, t as the system evolves, you also see the difference and history of the, the, the different systems results, not just the current moment in time. Seems straightforward, this slide. <laughs> but yeah, so you know, this is what we're trying to build. We're just trying to build this ability to do cognitive quality engineering, be able to learn from what's happening on the right-hand side, be able to bring that back in. You know, uh, Tarek always talks about testing in the, in, in, in the real world, as in it should be in the actual code base, so it's testing itself when it launches. But actually, you know, self-healing and all this great stuff that people talk about, really in the, uh, the chaos engineering and site reliability testing landscape is test observability, understanding how people are using it, whether it's the business, whether it's at, you know, during testing or development, learn from all of the things and then test all of the things, which is somebody else's quote. So anyway, I'll finish on that. There is a, a nice video here I'm gonna play in the background while I uh, stretch myself in, in a non-VR landscape, um, because there's some quite interesting stuff in the background, which we put together this demo, um, testing systems for um, the DOD, uh, for things like the F-15 jet, which we actually test the heads-up display, which they can look through the floor. So things like, uh, you know, Tom Cruise should have had it in, in Top Gun too, but he didn't quite have the tech. There's me back at my, actually, my home location for once, which never happens. Um, but it shows some of the tech that we're doing. So anyway, with that, I'm exactly uh, right on the money for the 45 minutes. Uh, I don't know if there's questions. Is there questions? Does anyone have any questions? I'll divert, divide them straight to Tarek. So what's the, the gentleman on the back, back row? Yeah, so I'd obviously love to say it's risk-based testing, so it knows what to go after first. But we do have a, an Adam uh, optimization, which as things get fixed, we're still able to look at the next best test. So it looks at the whole system, looks at what being run previously, 
and then the bits that are new. So when it discovers the system, if there's a new component, what's not, it wasn't in the digital twin before, it will actually go through and prioritize the execution of that section because it's never been tested. So it'll focus on that more, and there's like a kind of a regression algorithm that will focus where it thinks the system's not being tested and you spend the most time. But there's actually a really cool feature which will actually tell you how many hours you'll have to run to complete each one of those different types of set. And then you can make a decision of whether or not you let it run for 20 hours or you let it run for, for three hours or whatever else it be. So that's the best way of doing it, but it's a difficult one because otherwise you're just running every single permutation possible and there's maybe not as much value in that. Yeah, so obviously I mentioned the Source Labs integration there. We, we, we do what we, I would have referred to as SDODs, Secure Desktops on Demand. So if you've got like a Citrix, you're a bank or something, you want to be able to run on 10, 15, 20 machines, you can actually use the digital twin in our, our DAI product, which is the Digital Automation Intelligence, and actually to connect it to thousands of devices. So to give you an idea for the HoloLens, we're doing a mixture of about 15 physical devices uh, and the rest are just emulators. Um, so then it allows it to run through the emulators first and then prioritizes what it does with the physical devices because they're just development versions. Um, but also another streaming provider that may or may not have had a prequel uh, in quite recently series, um, they came to us and said, oh, could you test uh, 400 Apple TV boxes? And I, I went to Marcus and said, okay, can you host 500 Apple TVs and then test this streaming service platform uh, controlled by our system uh, and actually test to see if there's any kind of um, uh, kind of tearing or drop of frame rates. And we also want it in different geolocations. And that's where our network function virtualization and network virtualization really adds value because we can then start adding. We've got a, a platform called Scalable Networks, which will take a digital twin off a, a network system. So then you can actually inject that kind of jitter or whatever else it is and emulate, you know, SDNs and everything else. No worries. Well, oh, thank you very much. Wow. It's like, get off the stage. <laughs> You're done now. Thanks, guys. Oh, and by the way, there's a, uh, a drinks evening at um, tonight at 6 till 8 at the brewery place. The invites are over there, um, so free alcohol, just in case everyone wants to celebrate. Right, I better go back to the mixed reality. I'm starting to get shakes. Thanks, everybody.